Well, good evening. Welcome to Victory Baptist Church tonight. Let's all get a songbook stand and turn to page 159. Page 159. Appreciate you tuning our way this evening, and uh, let's get the ushers to come to receive our offering tonight, and uh, let's do continue to remember those among our church this evening that are sick, that God would touch them, and the Lord would meet the needs, amen, in their lives. I'm thankful that God is able. I'm glad he is the great physician, and uh, so let's pray tonight for all of those, and most of all, let's remember all of those in our families that are lost that the Lord would deal with their hearts and uh, we could soon uh, see them come to Christ. Amen. And uh, so let's just pray. And then let's pray for the service this evening and uh, for the Lord's will to be done. Uh, remember our missionaries, all of our, their families, that God would uh, help them. Amen. And God would meet every need there. Hallelujah. And uh, so let's just pray. And then let's remember, uh, pray for all those who will be traveling next Sunday make our way toward the Pigeon Forge. Everybody will get there safely. Everything will be good. And we want to 
don't have any problems, amen. I know last year they had a problem trying to get into the cabin. When they got there, after they gave us the code, the code wouldn't work. <clears throat> and so it was a terrible time trying to get in, amen. But So pray that this time it'll be a little better, amen. And they can get in without any problems. <clears throat> I think somebody had switched the code out. Some of the workers had switched it out and didn't inform the office. And the office gave us the old code, and so it didn't work, but amen. I got a six-pound hammer in my toolbox. That'll work just fine, amen. <laughs> amen. But anyhow, hallelujah, we're looking forward to a great, great week for a ride. So let's pray tonight uh, and just ask the Lord to help us and uh, to bless the offering and the service tonight. Brother Tim, pray for us. Let's all get a songbook, stand and turn to page 65, page 65.
I have to sing. You got to sing. I'm the one that was sick this week. I'm glad my wife feeling better. She was sick all last week. Thankful that she's doing a lot better. It's because he bragged on that Wednesday night before how I'd been doing good. Oh, baby. 
coming back from the Number one, the Bible says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by the But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made of the, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled into Lystra and Derby and cities of Lyconia and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, In the speech of the Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priests of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. Howbeit as the disciples stood round about him he rose up and came into the city and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel of that city and had taught many they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful again for the opportunity to be in your house on the Lord's Day. Thank you, God, for the good day you've given us. Thank you for the good rain that came our way. Thank you, Lord, for the time now to open your word and read from it. And I pray you'll bless the reading of the word to our hearing tonight. God, may you help us, Lord, as we look at these verses. God, may you speak to our hearts. May you help us, Lord, in our lives. Lord, that our lives would count for the cause of Christ. The Lord, our lives would be lived so that our light may shine 
that they may see Christ in us, that, Lord, we might be a walking testimony uh, to the grace of God in a world that's lost on a collision course with hell. God, help us tonight. We need your touch. Thank you again for all that you've done. I pray you'll bless every home here, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach tonight on this thought, the challenge of the church. Now, as we read these verses, we can see that clearly Paul and Barnabas and the others were making a significant impact upon the world around them. And of course, we know that uh, as they uh, were preaching the gospel that not everybody was pleased uh, with their efforts, but their work was recognized everywhere that they went. Now, many were happy in that day with just mere religion and worship, uh, and it was as they had no use for a man who was turning the world upside down for Jesus. And uh, when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ, uh, they abandon their old form of religion for a, a relationship with Christ. Amen. You see, tonight we're not worshiping a religion, but we have a relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus. Thank God. And uh, so this affected the followers of established religion. And in many cases, it affected the income of those who were profiting from that established religion. Now, our text we find tonight deals with various challenges that uh, Paul and Barnabas faced on uh, their first missionary journey. Now, we're a couple of thousand years removed from that day, but the challenges that they faced, you and I also in our day face some of the same challenges. You see, we are fighting the same devil they fought. Amen. The same devil that fought against them is the same devil that fights against us. And uh, so there are things that are happening and brings a challenge uh, to the church. Now, the people and the circumstances are different, but we continue to deal with the same issues that Paul faced. And if we're committed to turning our world upside down for Christ, we might as well to expect to encounter uh, challenges ahead of us. Amen. And what we've got to do is learn to identify and properly respond to the challenges that lie ahead of us. And so tonight as we think about the thought, the challenge of the church First of all, I want you to notice there's the challenge of division. The challenge of division. Now, we can see in the verses we read here tonight that there was the presence of division. In verses 2 and verses 4, look what the Bible said. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected toward or against the brethren. Verse 4 said, But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Now, Paul was not there looking to create a division, but it quickly appeared. Amen? And the Jews who refused to uh, heed to the teaching of Christ stirred up the unbelieving Gentiles, creating doubt and division among them. Paul had only been there a short time, but the city now has become divided. I think today that one of the greatest challenges in the church is to try to keep unity among the church. Beloved, God desires the church to be in unity with one another. Amen. And uh, as far as I can tell, as far as I know, you might know something I don't, but as far as I know, I don't know of any division at victory. Thank God. And we don't want no division at victory. Amen. And, uh, but it's not saying that it couldn't happen, but we've got to be careful that it doesn't happen. Amen. That there would be no division uh, that would come among us. Amen. And when division comes, division causes a lot of problems within the church. And if we are to be effective for reaching the world for, for Christ, we cannot 
be divided among ourselves. Amen. We've got to be careful. We've got to guard ourselves uh, from any division that may try to creep in. And the reason being, the Bible said in Mark 3, 25, and if a house be divided against itself, it cannot stand. Amen. And so there's the challenge of division. There's the presence of division here uh, with Paul and Barnabas. Then there's the point of division. Look at verse number one. The Bible said and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Now, as this was a great blessing, people were being saved at the preaching of the gospel. Amen. And as he preached the gospel, thank God the gospel had an effect and people were believing, they were accepting Christ, trusting Christ, and there were, they were being saved. Well, this was the point of the division among the people. Beloved, any time God starts working and, and blessing a church, the devil's going to try to slip in any way he can to stop that. Amen. And so people were being saved, and, and the devil started working. Amen. And so this was the point of division among the people in Paul's day. The Jews that had rejected Jesus, uh, they didn't want to follow the, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, they rejected it, and then they began to stir up others to be in opposition against uh, the gospel of Christ. Amen. And because Paul, as people were being saved, they were being led away from organized religion, and they were coming to Jesus, amen, and being born into the family of God. Now, oftentimes, divisions uh, comes about due to petty differences in a church. What's so sad is we major on the little bitty things that don't matter, and we cause problems, amen. Uh, I, I know that I, I, I started using this earpiece a couple weeks ago. Probably somebody's like, what's he doing using that? What does it matter? If I'm using a, 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 a clip-on or an earpiece, well, what if I just start carrying a microphone? It probably won't last long. But, but sometimes little things like that, it just gets on people's nerves. And if I knew this was getting on your nerves, I would wear it all the time. <laughs> That's mean, ain't it? But it's sad that we get so bent out of shape on things that don't matter. So many times churches divide and split over stupid things. Kids, put your ear, fingers in yours. But when they, 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 they talk about things that don't matter, I remember years ago, my pastor told me about our home church long before I was saved, and they, he had started the church, and, and so they were going to change the carpet. My home church, even I think right to this very day, and they have hardwood floors under the pews, and then they have a center aisle, and there's carpet that comes down the center aisle and carpet that comes up on to the platform. Well, for as I ever remember, all that carpet has ever been was red. Red. You say, why is it red? They got red pews. And then, so when they put the carpet in, they put red carpet to match the red pews. And so, but he said one time, years and years ago, he said that they was going to have to change the carpet and somebody wanted to change the color of the carpet. It's still red. <laughs> it didn't change, but some folks changed their location. Who cares? I mean, there are people going to hell. There are people that need to come to church. Who cares? That's petty stuff, amen? I mean, it really doesn't matter, but, uh, but what's so sad, and what I'm trying to get us across to us tonight is most of the time division comes over petty things. Amen. And uh, so it, it's sad that we'll allow the devil to get into our hearts by using little things. The Bible said it's a little leavener, leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He just takes a little bit. 
It, it just takes a little bit, amen, to cause a major problem. And so divisions come from petty differences, and many churches have split over trivial issues, amen? And so we've got to be on guard of anything like that, amen? And, uh, and the problem is many have given way into the modern pressures of society, and they have abandoned the truth of the gospel. Now, that should cause a division. If I come in and I start preaching something other than Christ, that should be a problem right there. Amen. But what color suit I wear or what kind of microphone I use, who cares? Amen. But we must major on the Bible and what the Bible has to say, and let's not divide ourselves over trivial things. Amen. And, of course, we're, we're entering a time, I believe, here in our country where the gospel creates contention. And if we're going to be committed to stand for the truth of God's word and preaching that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and the only way to heaven, it's going to cause division. Amen? Society demands tolerance. They want us to be tolerant of everything. And I got news for you. We don't have to be tolerant of those things that are wrong. And uh, so, but some people, they bow down to it. Even if tolerance demands the rejection of the word of God. But we should not allow that. Amen. And so there's the, the point of division. Then notice the patience in division. Look at verse 3. He said, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And as they preached and as they labored, division the grew stronger every day, with men being forced to choose sides. But Paul was not deterred from the call of God on his life. Amen. Even in the midst of all this mounting opposition, Paul stayed true to the preaching of the word of God. Amen. And he did it without compromise. He understood that not all uh, agreed with his teaching, but he refused to abandon the message just because some people didn't agree with it. Hey, not everybody agrees with what we're preaching here at Victory. Not everybody agrees with us standing on the Word of God, but that should not deter us from continuing to preach, continuing to stand, and be what God would have us to be in spite of what others may say. Amen? So there's the patience. He just kept on anyway. Society wants us to buckle under their pressure that they're putting on us. And the enemy seeks to gain entrance among us. But thank God, let's just keep preaching. Let's just keep teaching. Let's keep standing uh, on the word of God. Amen. Because the cause is too great to abandon an effort that we have to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. But then notice the problem with division. Look at verses 5 and 6. And when there was an assault. Now it's getting serious. Was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers. To use them to spitefully and to stone them. They were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and unto the region that lieth round about. And so the division eventually came so strong that the opposition desired to stone Paul and Barnabas. Isn't that amazing how mad folks can get? I mean, they can get something. There's, there's no telling what a man that gets mad and rebellious against the gospel, there's no telling what he could do. Amen? And so therefore, the opposition was, uh, they desired to stone Paul and Barnabas and and they were committed to putting an end to the preaching of Jesus. They wanted it out. They wanted it over and done with. They were doing all they can to stir up the people to fight against the preaching. And they were willing to even stone Paul if it need be. Now, division had not ended Paul's ministry. 
but it had affected the believers in Iconium. And the man of God was forced to flee the church, and the church suffered because of it. And that's usually the case. The church, those who are genuinely desired to serve the Lord, are usually the ones who suffer when division comes to a head and reaches the breaking point. Amen? And that, that uh, always bears a negative testimony for the church. Uh, it's sad when we, we major on the little things and we get mad over the little things that has nothing to do with the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, but yet we allow that to overpower whatever this book has to say. And we let it come in and tear us apart. Amen? The thing about it, if there is division, there will never be anything done for Christ if there's division. Amen? But not only the challenge of division, but then there's the challenge of confusion. Here's the challenges that are facing the church. Division is one of them. Then confusion is another. Amen? The verses 8 through 18 bears record of this. Now, as we look at these verses, notice, first of all, the submission of Paul. Look at verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, and being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Now, keep in mind, Paul had just fled uh, from Iconium. And, uh, but when he arrives in Lystra, we find that he immediately seeks to be used of the Lord. Amen. And his heart is in complete fellowship with the Lord. And he's sensitive to the Spirit of God in his life as he's there. And he encounters this lame man. Now, and as he encounters this lame man, the Bible said that Paul perceived that he had faith that he could be healed. Now, Paul saw that in that man. And then the manifestation of power is found in verse number 10. The Bible said that Paul said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. I love it. And he leaped and walked. Hallelujah. He leaped and walked. As Paul perceived the faith of this man, he commanded him to stand up on his feet, and the Bible said he leaped and walked. Can you imagine how the people felt when they knew that this man had never walked a day in his life? He's been lame from birth, never walked, never was able to do anything for himself. But now this man, something has happened. He's not only able just to stand, he leaped up. Amen. I'll be honest with you, it's hard for me to leap now. But the Bible said, here's, and here's the miraculous part of it, and you know as well as I do, if somebody's in a coma and they're down for several weeks, it takes them a while to get back to walking. They almost had to learn how to walk all over again. Here's man, they never learned how to walk. And the next thing you know, he leaped and started walking. I mean, God can do anything, can he? And uh, just not standing, he was leaping, he was walking. It's kind of like uh, the lame man that was at the beautiful gate back in Acts chapter 4, I believe it was. And the Bible said when he grabbed him by the hand, said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the Bible said he leaping up, started walking and leaping and praising God all the way to the temple. Isn't it amazing? Here's the manifestation of power. God had manifested his power through the obedience of Paul. But then notice the confusion of the people, verses 11. Now, the Bible said, upon seeing this great miracle, the people perceived that Paul and Barnabas to be gods. Amen. And they weren't even going to offer a sacrifice before Paul and Barnabas because they thought they were gods. And uh, Paul and Barnabas had a difficult time 
convincing them that they were witnessing a power that was not within themselves, but it was the power of God. Amen. This was the power of God that had been manifested in their lives so that they might believe the gospel. Now, you think about the events here. Now, the challenges for today, God uses men to preach the gospel. Amen. And uh, they are sold out for the cause of Christ. And they're sensitive to the leading of the Spirit of God. And uh, beloved, we need men that will just preach the word. And be preachers, what God's called them to, to do. Amen. And uh, I'm glad that God is still working in people's lives today. That God still has miraculous power to change people's lives just like he did that lame man. Amen. He still heals sickness and disease. I believe that. He still saves those, amen, who have lived wicked lives. He still restores homes that are on the brink of destruction. God's mighty power is revealed in miraculous ways through the lives of those that trust him. Amen. Now, but many today have the same problem these people did they get their eyes on the preacher. When they saw that great miracle, Brother Ray, they said, these are gods. I believe sometimes there are people in our churches that look at their pastor like he's a god. They worship the ground he walks on. That's not supposed to be like that. It's not about the pastor. It's about the Lord. Amen. Amen. And uh, God help us. I remember when I was a young preacher and uh, back years ago when we was at home and our, my pastor, and we had six young preachers in our church. And uh, he let us preach, take turns on Wednesday nights. He never knew who was preaching. He'd just show up on Wednesday night and one of us would be ready. And we knew who was supposed to be rotated round and round. And you know, it's amazing that some people wouldn't come when certain people was going to preach. Now, you know they wouldn't do that to me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brother Rick preaching tonight, and I believe I'll just stay at the house. It didn't matter to me who was preaching. I was going to be there. Whether I liked their preaching or not, I was going to be there. Just to show the devil I'm still on the Lord's side. Amen. But it's sad that some people nowadays, they, they look at that pastor as he is, he's just stepped out of the holy of holies, amen. But it shouldn't be that. We, we shouldn't get our eyes so much on a man that we forget about the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I think we should uh, recognize the office of the pastor. We should uh, be respective uh, of the office of the pastor. But the pastor is not to be worshiped. Amen. Well, I know I ain't got that to worry about. But uh, he stopped to be worshipped. But here they saw what they did. And they said, man, these are gods. They even changed the names. One's Jupiter, one's Mercurius. They even went God's sacrifices. They fixed it all for sacrifices because they thought these men were gods. I'm afraid sometimes some people, they, they think too highly. Again, we ought to respect the officer of the pastor. We respect the man of God. But he's a man. He's a man. He's, a, he's as capable of doing things as this like you are. Well, hallelujah. That went over good, didn't it? But we must avoid uh, that challenge of putting uh, preachers on a pedestal where they don't belong. Amen? Because the pastor didn't save you. It was the Lord who saved you. Amen? And uh, the pastor is not worthy of worship. Amen. He is there to experience worship along with the congregation and pointing people to Christ who alone is worthy to be worshiped. The challenge of the church, the challenge of division, there's the challenge of confusion. And then there's the challenge of persecution. There's the reality of persecution. Look at verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and 
having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Here they are at one point ready to worship him, offer sacrifices. Now they've stoned him, left him for dead. It's wonderful to be a preacher. I heard a preacher say one time he took a church, he said, man, everybody thought I was so sweet they could eat me up. He said, now some of them wish they had a amen. I heard one preacher say one time, he said, they asked him, he said, why did you leave your church? He said, because of, of uh, sickness. He said, sickness, yeah, they got sick of me. It's wonderful to be a preacher. People love you one minute, then they can turn against you in a heartbeat. Amen. My wife is always saying, you are one message away from the streets. <laughs> Brother Ian, she don't realize it, but if I hit the streets, guess where she's going to be living? <laughs> it's wonderful. I wouldn't trade the call of God for anything. But there is the reality of persecution. I mean, they were at one time ready to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods, and now they were quickly influenced from people from Antioch and from Iconium who were determined to silence of the preaching of the word of God, and so they stoned Paul and left him for dead. Amen? Now, I've never experienced the persecution like they did. So far, thank God, and I hope, that the church never goes through persecutions like they did. I hope none of us are ever stoned. I hope none of us are ever sawn asunder. I hope none of us are ever uh, crucified. I hope none of us are ever be persecuted in that way. But yet persecution is real. There are people around the world in other countries that suffer immensely for their faith in Christ. And many people lose their lives for the Lord. And so we've not experienced persecution like many have, but... You can rest assured if you're standing for the Lord Jesus, the devil don't like you, amen? And he will try to do everything he can to make you unproductive for Christ. And uh, so we must make a difference in our community. And if we do, persecution is going to come. Paul suffered for serving the Lord. And if we are going to serve the Lord, there will be persecution. Notice the resolve in persecution. Look at verse 20 and 21. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystria and to Iconium and Antioch. Here's a man stoned and left for dead. But Paul refused to abandon the call of God on his life. Amen. And he rose up. Can you imagine what he looked like if they had stoned him enough to where they thought he was dead? Can you imagine what he looked like as those stones had hit him and, and cut him and bruised him and blackened him? And I mean, all the things, the pain that he was involved in, all that. But yet when he got up, as the disciples were standing around, they probably thought he was dead too or almost dead. He got up. And then he went back to preaching. Didn't stop him. There's a resolve there in his heart, amen? And tonight difficulties and opposition will come. But when they do, we need the resolve like Paul had, that we're not going to stop. We're not going to let the devil stop us. We're not going to give up. We're not going to give in. We're not going to give out. But we're going to keep on going, amen, for the cause of Christ. But then notice the reaction to persecution. The Bible said in verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel in that city, they had taught many. They returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. Verse 22, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord of, on whom they believed. Amen. I mean, praise God, Paul didn't give up and ride off into the sunset and retire somewhere. He went right back to the same place. 
where they had stoned him, where they had left him for dead. But no, he went back and he continued to work and to help and, and to build the church and to, to confirm uh, uh, those in the church and get them to stand. And thank God they saw the boldness of Paul. And that helped them to do what they needed to do. Amen. Oh, thank God he immediately resumed the ministry. His life had been changed when he met Christ on the Damascus Road. He had never forgot it. Amen. He had never got over what the Lord had done for him. Amen. May I say tonight, it isn't a matter of opposition or adversity that will come, but when it comes, what are we going to do? How are we going to react when the problems arise? I've been pastor here almost 37 years. Brother Ray, there have been a few Sunday nights that I have gone home and I said, I'm done. It's, I'm through. Dealing with so many issues and things that were going on, you'd think, it just, it ain't worth it. Man, I'd go to bed defeated, Brother Mark. I, I mean, I was so defeated and I done made up my mind, I'm done with it. Come Monday morning, I'd wake up. The Holy Ghost said, you need to get up, son. It's time to go. You say, what'd you do? Came right back. Rired back one more time, preached again. Amen? Amen. And I know, I remember years ago, I had a preacher tell me, he said, I'm going to tell you something. And I was a young preacher, and I, I thought back then, I thought I knew everything. Brother Ian, when I came to victory, I knew it all. 29 years old, I knew everything. I used to go to meetings when I was a younger preacher, and I'd, I'd think, bless God, just let me preach. Boy, I'm glad they didn't let me preach because I could have straightened that whole outfit out, I thought. But as I began to grow in the grace of God, I'd go to those meetings. I'd say, oh, God, don't let them call on me. Amen. Some of them say, won't you preach this morning? I said, look, if you got anybody else, let them have it. Amen. But when I was here, I, I, I knew everything. I had a preacher tell me this one time. He said, I'm going to tell you something, Brother Rick. He said, the thing about being a pastor, he said, it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to have problems. how to really discourage a man because there's got to be a place where there is no problem somewhere well there is called heaven I'm, a, I'm ready to go but I ain't no hurry say amen right there but he said no matter where you go he said you're going to have the same problems different faces I found that to be true amen so that helped me for a while and even when opposition comes, we just got to keep standing and keep preaching. As I said, as far as I know, now, if you know something I don't, just leave me alone. Don't even tell me about it. Because I'm living in la-la land right now, thinking everything's perfect. But uh, I don't know of any divisions, any oppositions I, I, among our people. If there is, I'm sorry. I hate you being in the wrong. But... Uh, but that's not going to stop us. Amen? That's not going to stop us. And I'm not trying to be hateful or disrespectful to anybody. But we just got to keep standing where we know we need to stand regardless of what other people do. Amen? I know my pastor, he pastored the church that he started for 35 years. And he stayed there 35 years. And over those 35 years, he... He's seen a lot of different changes over those years. He saw days of great glory, but then he saw days of great poverty. He saw days where they was in the glory, and then there were days where you wouldn't, couldn't even find, seemingly you couldn't even find God. But you know what he did, Brother Mark? He just stayed there. Well, he got discouraged. He, he told me several things over the years and, and, and that he got discouraged, and it got so bad, and and then uh, he said in 1978, he said, it got really bad. He said, I didn't know what we was going to do. 
He said, I didn't even know how we was going to survive. He said, all I knew to do was pray. In the end of that year, somebody got saved. A couple of people got saved. The next year, 1979, is the year Deb and I got saved. And during that year, God sent revival to our church at home. And during that year, there were people saved every service. I'm talking about Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. There were people saved on Thursday night when we'd go visit. They'd, people had just got saved. They'd go visit somebody that wasn't saved, and they hadn't been saved long enough to even tell them how to get saved, so they'd put them in the car and bring them back to the church with them. It was amazing. And every Sunday, you could just see God just, and people just started flocking in. And that church went from hardly nothing to it full during that year. I mean, God sent revival. Oh, my stars. But I thought about it like this. Had my pastor give up? Brother Rick, had my pastor give up in 78? I might not have got saved in 79. Because the person that got saved in 78 went to that church. What if they wasn't that church to go to? Amen. But thank God he just kept standing and standing and standing. In the midst of opposition, depression, all things that happened, but he just kept standing. Hey, church, you know what we got to do? We just got to keep standing. There are some challenges that we may face in our lives. There are challenges that we face as a church, challenges that we face as individuals, as families, but yet we know the truth and we know where we need to stand and let's just keep standing there and don't let the devil move us. Amen. I'm glad tonight God's able to help us to do that in our lives. Father, I thank you tonight, God, for your word, God, what it means to our hearts this evening. God, thank you for these men that we read about in the Bible. Lord, and in spite of all their opposition and all that they suffered in their lives, they never quit doing what God had called them to do. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. God, help me as your preacher that you've called to preach. God, help me to stand regardless of what others may do. Help us, Lord, here as a church, as families, as homes, as individuals, that we would stand for what is right, stand for Christ in spite of what others may do. God, I thank you for Victory Baptist Church, and I thank you for the many blessings that you have given to this church and the families and, Lord, what you are doing in their lives. Thank you, Father, God, for what we are seeing in these days at the Victory Baptist Church. And I pray, Lord, that we can continue to see your hand upon the church, that souls will be saved, and God, lives will grow in the, the knowledge of Christ, and, oh, God, that there would be greater unity and love and oneness of spirit God among us thank you father thank you for every blessing God help us we pray in Jesus name while we stand tonight and our heads are bowed eyes are closed I wonder are you willing to just stand in spite of the opposition in spite of the difficulties I mean, Paul stoned him. They stoned him. Left him for dead. But when he got up, he went right back to preaching. Never giving up. Eventually it cost him his life. But he was faithful. Paul said, I've kept the faith. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. That's what I want to be able to do at the end of my life. Say, I fought a good fight. Kept the faith. Finished the course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, but not to me only, but unto also all them that love his appearing. Hallelujah. Be faithful until the Lord comes. Be faithful until the Lord calls you home. 
Just be faithful. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Father, thank you again, God, for every blessing you've given in our lives. And I thank you for every home individual at Victory Baptist Church. God, help us, I pray, in these days that our light may shine, that we may see people come to Christ. And we'll thank you, God, for what you've done, what you're doing, and going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sure appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate you being here throughout the day today. Do pray much for the service Wednesday night. Don't forget now, Wednesday night will be uh, prayer night for Arise. And uh, all of you that are planning on going to Arise, you got your shirts today. Those are our team colors. Our team colors, team color is red. And uh, so that's our team color. And then we'll get another shirt uh, when we get to Arise. That'll be the color that you'll wear on a rise t-shirt day and i think that'll i think they wear them to dollywood don't they they wear them to dollywood but uh so be here wednesday night everybody that can and uh, let's uh, spend some time praying the youth choir all that can be here be here wednesday night to sing and uh so we're looking forward to a wednesday night amen and then they'll can we'll continue the superhero theme uh uh, bringing out a superhero in the Bible. And uh, so you pray for us that the Lord will use us. Amen. To be an encouragement to everyone that will be here on Wednesday night. Well, I hope you have a great week this week. Be sure to pray for each other. And uh, look forward to Wednesday night. Amen.